All right, so really exciting times here at AI. Um, if you guys were a part of our user group last month, you would have seen the launch of the Next Generation Bullhorn Remote Monitoring Platform. Um, and you know, this is this is more than just an, an RMU. It really is an entire system. Um, and it's really cool because, you know, as we went about um, redesigning our remote monitors, we really wanted to tackle some key user experiences that uh, really could have been better. So one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was um, immunity towards surge event, lightning event damage. And we found that really your RMU is only going to be as strong as your weakest link. And oftentimes, that weakest link, you know, after you beef up the remote monitor tends to be, you know, the relay, the power supply, or any of the other peripherals attached to that system. And that's because most of those other peripherals aren't really designed for the CP industry, right? They're, they're components that are purchased from a different, um, for, for different applications and then kind of retrofit to work in our cathodic protection space. Um, so we wanted to change that. We wanted to make products that were truly designed for the CP environment, and that's what we did. Um, so you're going to see a few different components here. I'm going to talk about the, um, the RMU system, which includes the communications dome, the IO module. Um, also, I'm going to talk about the power supply that we've designed, the relay that we've uh, designed, and show you how all of this goes together. At the end of this, I'm going to take you over to Bullhorn Web. That way you guys can see um, what that user experience is like. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the next steps or, or what's to come, um, at least from these product lines. All right, so let's start by talking about the, the IO module. So this is a much, much smaller form factor. You know, it's going to be, um, you know, probably the size of like a, a small remote control which is great because it gives you the flexibility to install it most anywhere inside of, of the rectifier, regardless of, of the size, you're gonna find a place to install this. Um, and this is gonna come with a couple of mounting options. You can either use the screw mounts that are provided or um, it's gonna ship out with magnets um, pre-installed on this. So that way you can just stick it to any ferrous surface. Um, realize that a lot of the rectifiers out there are made with aluminum chassis, but the railing that the um, that the uh, racks are usually mounted on tend to be a ferrous metal, so they they do stick on really nicely to that. Um, one of the innovations that we've added to this type of system is what we're calling flying leads. So you see that those input wires going into the RMU, they're not wires that you would screw on at that I/O module. They are um, hardwired into the board. They're soldered in there and then they're encased in, in an epoxy. And the main reason is because we wanted to remove um, the points where surge event and arcing can occur away from the electronics. And we found that by doing this, it really provides the best possible isolation from those type of events on the electronics. Um, so it comes pre-wired um, you know, for four channels with, you get a, I think like three feet of cable there. And then we'll talk about how that connects to uh, the rest of your rectifier a little bit up ahead. All right, as far as uh, going out to the communications uh, dome, we're using a pretty standard industry standard cable, which is an M8 connector. Um, this is great because it's a much smaller form factor than the one that we were using before. So if you have to drill out of your rectifier to get into the dome, um, it's only a half inch hole that you need to drill. Um, which is not as difficult as, as anything bigger. As I mentioned, this thing is encased in, um, in epoxy uh, throughout, and this helps us with a few ways. One, it makes sure that um, we are um, protected against like dust and, and insects and water, and also it improves that surge immunity. Alex, we got yeah. a question about what, we, what standard we test to in order to ensure performance. Oh, we have, um, and I can send you the exact specifications, but we do a few different types of testing. So all of these are designed to be, um, you know, CE compliant um, and, um, and, and we go through a series of uh, highly accelerated light tests. We call it HALT testing. And that is a series of standards for 
shock, vibration, um, surge, uh, a variety um, that basically makes sure that this thing is going to be um, up to spec and, and lasting for a very long time. So um, I don't have the exact numbers because they're it's like MTH157834, um, but uh, we can send those afterward. And I think they're also listed on our data sheet, if I'm not mistaken. All right, um, but with every IO module, it comes with uh, BLE built-in. So you don't need any additional accessories um, for you to use this uh, with your with your phone to configure the device, um, you would simply swipe the magnet right there where that little arrow is, that initiates the the BLE signal, and then with the uh, Android or iOS application, then you can go in and configure it. Um, but I would like to note that that iOS Android application is coming out um, the early part of next year. Um, in the meantime, because these are cell devices, you can do all of your configuration from Bullhorn Web just as easily. And then a future feature that is coming out on this, we've we've built it into the hardware. Um, this is also going to come out a little bit later, but that's that multiple I/O expansion. So the idea is that, you know, you could purchase at a later time um, uh, several I/O modules, up to three additional ones, and daisy chain them together to this one, and they would all be a part of the system. So if you want to increase your channel count up to sixteen, um, you could do so just by adding more I/O modules to the system. The next component is going to be the communications dome. So whether it's a cellular or a satellite uh, radio communication, um, it, it basically it's an inconspicuous box that is going to be mounted outside of the rectifier. Um, you don't have to do anything extra as far as orienting it towards a certain direction. Um, you know, they're both going to be in omnidirectional, um, at least for cellular and for satellite, you just want to make sure you have um, clear view to the sky. Um, but these are surge hardened as well in terms of how we've developed and designed the board um, to make sure that um, they have the optimal spacing to prevent arcing to occur. And these devices tend to be a little bit more protected anyway because they are really um, more isolated from the rest of the system. Um, the cell one that we're looking at here is using the LTE CADM radio um, which is part of the, the latest 5G technology stack. So um, the 5G network, you know, has really two purposes. One of them is going to be the high data rate, you know, which is going to be on stuff like your cell phones for streaming video and music, um, and especially good when while in cities. Um, that high data rate is not as great for these types of commercial devices because it doesn't have a very long range. So in order to make sure that um, that, that generation of, of radio, of cellular technology um, really has an option for both types of devices, they've added the, the LTE CAD-M as part of that 5G. So LTE CAD-M is great for your industrial IoT type devices, which are gonna be longer range. Um, data throughput is not as fast, but you don't really need to because, you know, these things aren't very, uh, you know, um, data, uh, data heavy um, in terms of their usage. You know, we're talking about kilobytes versus your phone, which is using gigabytes, you know, factors of, of a million times more. All right. Um, in there, uh, we're also going to have a field replaceable battery. That battery is really just to give you um, a holdover in case you lose any power to your rectifier, it should last a few days, um, and just give you um, the ability to send out an alarm, let you know that that you've lost power. Um, but it's a, it's a battery that's rechargeable, it'll last several years, and if you ever do need to rechange it, um, it's a field swappable battery, so pretty easy to do so. And um, inside this device, we also have a GPS chip uh, built in so that you can uh, get your coordinates as you would expect from a remote monitor these days. And let me know if there's any questions in the chat. I can't see the chat, so just, uh, just let me know here. All right, so the next part of the system here is the power supply. Again, um, you know, redesigned specifically for this application, um, you know, fully potted inside, magnetic mounts, 
Um, the really cool thing about this is that it's going to power off of the secondary taps. So you don't need to um, uninstall the breaker and attach your wires there to the primary side. You can simply hook them up to the secondary, which is much more accessible inside of the rectifier. Um, and it makes installation a lot quicker. The only thing you need to identify is a 10 to 42 voltage source and just make sure that the power um, that you're attaching to, those, those taps that you're attaching to are not the same ones that you're gonna attach your relay to. Because then as soon as that relay switches, you're gonna lose power. Um, so really that's the only thing to, to keep in mind. And we'll show that in the system diagram. And then um, this, is, this is also a really, really cool device. We've had a lot of really positive feedback um, from our customers who have used this. So this is the next iteration of our um, solid state relay. A couple of years back, we released the uh, 2310 solid state relay. Um, we've made some improvements on that one. And so now this is the 2510. Um, you know, we have the magnetic mounting. This is about the size of an iPhone, right? So this is a 100 volt, 100 amp solid state relay um, about the size of an iPhone. So very small form factor. Uh, you'd mount it on making contact with a, the rectifier chassis so that you know you can use that as part of your heatsink. Um, if you're not mounting it onto some sort of metal surface, then you know there's a derating curve. So basically, this becomes an, an 80 volt, 80 amp solid state relay. So you know if you do want to get to those higher voltage and current levels, just make sure it's making contact with that metal surface. And uh, the magnetic mounts are are flush on the enclosure so that you can just stick it on and it'll make good contact. Um, fully potted as well, and also gets its power from the taps. And this one I believe is asking for um, seven to, or sorry, three to 30 volts. So seven to 30 volts, I should say. So there's some overlap with your power supply. So you could, if you find something between like 10 and 30 volts, you could attach a, both your power supply and your relay to the same taps and just keep it simple. All right. And then the very last part of this is the terminal block. So we talked about those flying leads coming out of the IO module. Um, those are going to attach to these <coughs> terminal blocks. So, you know, if you ever do have a search event and you might, right, you know, nothing is going to be foolproof. Um, and sometimes you can have some very gnarly search events out, out in the field, but you know this entire system is going to be able to handle the majority of them. But if you ever do have a surge event, um, this is the component that's going to take the brunt of that. And it's a very, very cheap component to replace. And you even get one extra um, as a part of the kit, so long as you know, you're not using channels three and four. So you know, we suspect that you'll probably have extra of these lying around. Um, so it should be fairly easy to swap these out should, should you ever need to. Um, but nothing really special about this. It's just, you know, a terminal mount. So, you know, you attach on one side um, the leads coming out of, out of your RMU. And on the other side, you attach them to your rectifier. All right. So quickly, let's, let's go through what that installation looks like. So... I'm going to start this by looking at the power supply. So as I mentioned, your power, find your um, the voltage source that's that's appropriate. Um, in this case, you know I chose those two. Relay, same thing. You're going to find your voltage source. In this case, it was like a 10 volt to 30 volt coming off of the taps. They're attached to the same location. You're going to introduce the IO module into, into this equation. You know, power the lines coming out of the uh, power supply into the inputs of the RMU. Connect your relay control lines also to that RMU, and then you connect your channels. So channel one is going to be your rectifier amps typically, which is uh, across the shunt. And then you have uh, rectifier volts, which is your channel two on the output of the rectifier. Um, you have options for three and four, um, but that's up to you whether whatever you wanna use those for. Um, there's another terminal box included, there's wiring as well. So you have options for that. And then the last step here is just to connect your, um, your relay wires and your dome connector. Um, and your, your relay is gonna go across whatever um, taps you would, typically have your bus bar. 
So that's going to control the uh, cathodic protection going to the pipeline. Um, and again, as I mentioned, make sure that these uh, relay control lines are not um, the same ones that you're getting your power from. Okay, so are there any questions at this point about um, anything that you've seen so far related to the hardware? All right, and feel free to put your, your uh, questions in the chat after the fact. Um, you know, I'm really curious to get your, your impressions as well. If this is the first time seeing this, um, you know, just drop us a line in the chat and just let us know what you think. Or, uh, you know, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, we have our, our sales guys and, and any of us uh, ready to talk more about this ad nauseum. <laughs> All right. But um, I'm going to jump over here now to Bullhorn Web and then show you the, the software side of things. Um, and you're going to find that it's it's a fairly um, intuitive uh, process as well. So I'm going to go to new share. Let's see. Be fun to hold up. I don't know what are you, are you guys in the Bakken conference room by any chance? What was that? Are you in the Bakken conference room? It'd be fun to hold oh, up. Our there we are. Yeah, he has it right there. Uh, yeah. Look at if you look at Cole's window. Oh yeah. Oops. It's, it's your window. Alex is gonna. There we go. So here's our I/O module. As Alex is saying, it's about the size. Fits in the palm of my hand. Very easy to fit. And our new relay, as well, twenty-five ten. For <laughs> just to show a comparison, about the size of an iPhone. Very accurate oh. comparison, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and our um, potted re and those, like you said, those free leady. Oh those leads that are potted inside the IO module into the terminal box that they'll take the brunt of the surge. But all in all, a very compact and so, um, very compact solution. Sweet, thank you. All right, so now you guys should be looking at Bullhorn Web. Correct, cool, great. Yep. <laughs> all right, so I have you here. Um, this is just one of the test accounts that I have set up, and I have a couple of, of my RM5 units on here. So a couple of things that are a little bit different than um, our previous generation. So we have the, the dome listed out there, and then there's this little carrot dropdown, which shows you all of the IOs associated to it. So right now, I only have one IO module um, associated to this, and from that IO module, you would see um, all of your analog readings. And so if you had multiple associated to this one dome, you would see all of those as well. One of the things that's really cool about the system is that we try to make the whole process a lot easier for you to set up and install. So you can see, for example, that this IO module here um, is showing this little red power symbol, which is indicative that it's not installed. Um, and that's because you know there's only a dome here, right? There's an IO module that will likely be to it, but it's, it's not um, online, um, whereas this one is. Now, when it came time to actually break it online, the only thing you have to do is just um, you know, hook it up to the dome and to the power, and the rest is automatically taken care of in the back end. So you, know, you can swap IO modules from one terminal to another, it doesn't matter. Um, the system is going to auto detect which one is there, and it's going to um, reset it in, in Bullhorn Web with however you had your settings associated to to that dome. So that's some really cool stuff. Um, so let's let's dive into one of these. All right, you're going to see that um, you have the option again to see all of your readings. We split them up um, from your I/O module, so you're you're going to see your your analog readings up here first to any of the IO modules you have associated. And then you have all of that ancillary data associated to the dome below, such as like your latitude, longitude, your DC input, your voltage battery, stuff like that. Here on the left-hand side, um, we've simplified this a little bit as well. So you have your important information like your facility IDs, system serials, but you also see your RM5 IO modules. And so this one tells you which IO modules are associated to this dome and it tells you their status. If you need to go in and configure anything, um, much like our other arm use, just click the pencil. You have um, all of the settings that you could 
uh, changed before, such as you know just metadata about your facility, um, your reporting schedules as well. Um, you would go and change that as well. You have a few options, right? Um, repeat, day of month, the frequency, reporting interval. Um, and then you have the configurations for the channel as well. So this is where we're starting to play around with some of the features that you're going to be seeing coming up here in the future for, for American Innovations. Um, you know, what we've started to do is integrate from looking at it at a mobile first solution, right? So this screen is entirely built, looking at it from the perspective of mobile. And we've imported this into Bullhorn Web. So we're starting that transition of, of really making this a more friendly site for, for mobile in that you know, has a few different uh, ways that we can play around with that. But much like you would expect with, with a mobile application, you know, when you go in and try to make a settings change, you click that and then it brings out a slide out and here's where you would make any changes um, associated to those channels. By default, you're gonna have channels one and two enabled. Channel one is going to be predefined as your rectifier amps. Channel two is your rectifier volts and then the rest of them are gonna be turned off. Um, if you want to enable a channel, it's just as easy as clicking, um, you know, this button here. Now it's enabled. Or, you know, you can go into the channel itself, show the channel, and then, you know, specify how you want to configure this unit. Um, one of the other cool things here, so as I go into this um, AMPS channel setting, you know, if you want to set it to... Um, uh, to be used with like a, a shunt, for example. Typically you'd set the input type to millivolts, you'd enable scaling, and there you put in your ratio for whatever type of shunt you have, whether it's a 5100, a 100 however you want, you know, just specify the millivolts here in the amp scaled, and um, it'll set it appropriately for you. Um, and then, you know, you have the ability to, to set alarms, so high alarm, low alarms, and then this persistence is how long the alarm has to be in terms of minutes, how long it has to be active before you'd get any type of notification. Because, you know, you're not always interested in, in the time it immediately happens. Sometimes it's just a blip or a fluke. So you might want to give it some buffer so that you're not getting false alarms. Um, but other than that, um, you know, it is pretty intuitive. Once you start playing in here, you know, the feedback that we've gotten so far is that it's a pretty nice user experience. But we're always working to, to refine this and make it better. And you know, you're going to be seeing a lot of that coming out of AI um, you know, in, the, in the upcoming months, both in terms of the, the hardware that we're releasing. You know, we said this is an RMU platform, so you're going to see different iterations. Uh, the first thing that's coming up is the satellite version of this product. And then you know, there's going to be test point variants um, for you know, your pipe to soils or AC as well. And then um, there's also going to be improvements on the software side, um, on the mobile side, so that you can configure these units a little bit easier and, and have this better user experience. All right, so that's that's my bit. Um, are there any questions right now for, for any of us? Um, Alex, maybe uh, really quick, can you can you explain what we did with with Bullhorn to PCS? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so here, so let's just take a look at, at, at this one, cause I'm already here, but you can see that this engineering units here is, is DC underscore amps. When you're, when you're bringing in data into PCS, PCS is expecting data to come in, in a certain format. Um, and that can be defined by you, um, or, you know, there's already some, some presets there when PCS. Typically, most people adhere to, to the same type of, of nomenclature um, across the board. So what we did is we locked it down, especially for like our legacy units, um, so that when you're going in and entering um, those engineering units, um, it gives you a drop-down list of, of what is acceptable for that channel type. Um, so an analog channel you know, might show you DC underscore amps, DC underscore volts, um, you know, uh, P slash S. And we're hoping that this guidance will allow you to select the type of measurement that you want by going through the dropdown. 
and then not, you know, mistyping or fat fingering the, the engineering units, which would cause your link to break between Bullhorn Web and PCS. Um, we made sure though, not to completely lock it down because we have customers who have some, some custom fields on there. So, you know, if you don't want to use anything in the dropdown, you can just type it out as you normally would. Um, and so long as you're consistent between how that's uh, labeled in Bullhorn Web and PCS, uh, you should be good. Thank you, Alex. A um, couple of things. Nick asked if the Voltanamps channels, for instance, can you use any of the four channels for anything you want? And the answer is yes. They all have yes. the same input range and everything, right? We just tried to simplify installation by doing those default labels. That's correct. correct. Yep, yep. We found that like 99% of our customers use this type of format, channel one amps, channel two volts. So, you know, we tried to, you know, eliminate a step from your configuration by presetting it, but you can change them however you want. Um, great. Uh, Brad, uh, I asked um, Richard Counts, the, the VP of R&D, to look at what standard we test the RM5 to, and it's, it's UL 61010, uh, and then MIL standard 810G. So um, there's a bunch of versions to 61010, um, and so the actual answer is a lot longer than that, but, uh, but that's the high-level UL standard, um, and then MIL standard 810G. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, um, I mean, I was thinking on, like, I know when it comes to, for example, AC mitigation devices, uh, they subject those to pretty rigorous industry testing to see how they withstand things like uh, surges and whatnot. So um, yeah. I look at your equipment in the same light, you know, it's what, whatever it potentially could be subjected to in the field is. Uh, there's there's got to be an industry test that that would subject them to that so that you guys know that you know if things are going to blow up or uh, that right. they're not going to blow up. So yeah. right. So though, I think those tests I just gave you were mostly around safety, right? Um, we actually created our own surge test system because the one that we could buy off the shelf wasn't high enough. So our data sheet does does provide data on. You know, uh, surge is tricky because it's it's voltage, current, and time. So you can withstand tons and tons of voltage for a tiny period of time. Um, yep. So we we provide data on our data sheet on that one as well. Okay. And fun well. fact, we named that surge testing system Shockzilla. So if you ever want to come visit Shockzilla, you know, come to our <laughs> users group next year, and we'll show it. 